seeds. A promise to meet again at the next growing season. I have watched you all spring and all summer. And I've watched you grow woody with autumnal seed. This is an invitation to mingle. Do you remember looking at a dandelion as a child? The way its fluffy dome urged your little grubby fingers to pick it with caution, so not to spill its multitude of little parachutes before you had a chance to blow on it. There was so much pleasure and excitement around that when I was little. And then there was also some of the pods that you could snap in your fingers and they would just curl back, exposing the seeds. Fun. They were engaging, and I think that's what seed pods, you know, are designed to do in some way. Um, they're designed for interaction. Some seeds, like the ones of cleavers, rely on that contact for dispersal. Uh, they latch onto clothing and onto fur and wool, and are carried across landscapes, like hitchhikers. You also have other seeds, like those found in, in berries, um, and they enter the digestive tract of animals and, and humans. I mean, we are animals, um, but animals and humans, and, um, and then they aren't digested, and so they get dispersed through feces uh, with a little bonus fertilizer. Um, and of course, you have tufty, flowy seed heads, like the ones of the dandelion, uh, of bog cotton and the willow herb, for example. And these get carried by the wind, um, but their appearance facilitates interaction, especially for children. So like I mentioned earlier, there's an urge to, to pick it, uh, to pick a seed head um, because of its appearance and to blow it in the wind. You are dispersing the seed, you are the wind in this uh, moment. And in a way, all these seed heads are an invitation. They rely on interaction for dispersal, and so they are cleverly designed for that very purpose. This next extract is uh, from a poem in the garden scene by Sylvia Alexandra. Plans. We visited a garden in the early winter. It was rusting purple and brown, but still upright. A garden of textures, and we popped seed pods into our palms and scrunched crisp flower heads with our fingers. They were indistinguishable, but beautiful. A heaven in a wild flower. Fluffy germs and grains impregnated our pockets. I put the seeds from the garden, saved in small plastic bags and held them up to the white sky to look at them. At that time, they were still yours and mine. I sat out winter lunchtimes in a desolate rose garden with traveler's joy laughing over my shoulder, enduring the churned clay earth, the wet air and the rain dripping under the trees clutching corals and fossils as treasures, just for the trust of blooms again. We are both feeling low in the depths of winter. I remember an evening when our skin was hot with sun driving home up the island, winding the green of hills and then reaching the boggier parts. We had these plans to make pillows, to make bog cotton pillows, but somehow we could never get comfortable enough. And there was the downy fluff of the grey lag waiting in a carrier in the kitchen. Our skin was hot with sun and the bog cotton was flowing. Imagine if it all released in just one moment.
During lockdown, it was the repetition of my walks that made me pay attention to certain plants with greater detail. I purposefully took the same roots and some of them weren't necessarily scenic. Um, one of them particularly was just going to the supermarket. But outside of my big supermarket, um, there is a row of wild plants. And so I kept visiting this parking lot throughout lockdown, starting with spring. And I was amazed to see that this little, you know, this little tiny corridor of plants had its own small seasons. Um, so the way it changed from blooming with uh, bright yellow dandelions um, and then the cleavers started taking over. Then you had thistle that started emerging and growing. Um, and this one aquilegia plant that I spotted and that I kept coming back to because of its exciting purple flowers. Um, and then, you know, the yellow would fade from the dandelions and suddenly it was in seed. So you had this kind of cottony tufts of white and off-white. Um, and then the clover started appearing as well, taking over. And so there's all these kind of like small seasons um, and it was fascinating to watch. But what really kind of caught my eye was this aquilegia plant. Um, I became quite, you know, obsessed with it. Um, and so I kept visiting it and it grew and, it, you know, it blossomed and then it died uh, or went to seed. Um, and aquilegia seed pods are so beautiful and kind of almost cruel. <laughs> That's just the only word I can use to describe how they look. Um, and so I collected the seed and I've decided to plant some in my garden next year to, to see that plant grow again. But it was this practice, you know, of returning, the practice even of, you know, paying attention to curbsides because obviously the council during lockdown wasn't um, spraying the curbs so, so plants had a chance to pop through the cracks in the pavement and, you know, there was a whole entire herbarium growing there on the side of, of the street um, and that was fascinating to me and and that pilgrimage, you know, that kind of going back to see a plant uh, through the seasons, throughout its different manifestations and waiting, waiting for the seeds. Um, it's almost like your invitation, like your ticket to, to see it again next year if you decide to plant it or let or, you know, kind of help in its dispersal. And that's what I'm inviting you to do, uh, to incorporate seed spotting into your walking practice. Seed spotting starts with plant spotting. Um, it isn't just something to do now when many plants have gone to seed, but all throughout the year, um, through the seasons. Part of this practice is taking note and identifying the plant as they grow. It is obviously a whole other exercise to identify plants when they have gone to seed rather than when they have, you know, put out their leaves or their flowers. Having that practice of, you know, spotting and knowing where seeds are, where plants are uh, throughout, throughout the seasons and knowing exactly where to go to collect your seeds I'd be like, oh, well, that was red campion, so I'm going to go now and collect my red campion seeds, or, oh, that was aquilegia. Um, and you can start to develop a small seed library. And a seed library is incredibly a uh, fun thing to have. Um, you can make your own seed packs, you can keep them in jars. Um, you can use uh, tinted glass jars, you know, the ones that sometimes contain uh, yeast extract of a certain brand so I won't 
mention, but that's always kind of tinted uh, dark brown, the glass. So that's perfect for keeping the light out and, and keeping your seeds in. Um, and it's interesting as well to label them. So you, even if you don't know what it looks, what it if you don't know what the plant is labeling, what it looks like, where you found it, and at what time you picked the seeds, what date. Um, and so next year there's a chance as well that it'll grow again in the same spot because often plants self seed as well. They they drop seeds in the same place with the intention of kind of growing back there again in the right conditions. Um, and then a seed library is in, is fun to have as well because you can create your own seed mixes. You can uh, trade seeds with your friends, um, and you can bring plants that you found curbside um, those curbside plants you don't necessarily want to to be making infusions from you don't necessarily want to dry and eat those plants uh, that everyone's been trampling on that cars have um, polluted but if you take that seed and you plant it again in somewhere a bit more sheltered like in your garden then you can for example pick the pineapple weed uh, that you enjoy in your tea, knowing that it's not as contaminated as it was if it was growing curbside. say to watch out for um, are the umbrelliferaes. One simple way to tell if a plant belongs to this family is to look for the flower heads um, and if they take on an umbrella shape when the plant is mature then you're pretty sure it's going to be an umbrellifera. And this family is incredibly diverse um, and you have plants like hogweed, cow parsley, angelica, uh, the hemlocks, parsnips, carrots, um, and then it might, and I think like maybe an in, inexperienced person might uh, tend to think that they look alike. And actually, uh, there's a couple that you need to really watch out for that you really don't want to have growing near you. One of them is a giant hogweed. Um, which I'm sure you know about and can cause severe burns if you touch the plant itself. Another plant you need to watch out for is Hibalayan balsam. And this one is a bit tricky because it is an amazing plant. So you can eat uh, pretty much the whole plant and it's often eaten in curries. Uh, you can pick the the flowers and the flowers actually you can you know color your gin with you can make uh, decoctions um, you can eat the seeds as well but the reason it's a tricky plant and you want to steer clear from it um, is because actually it's incredibly invasive and um, <laughs> And one of the reasons why it's invasive is because its seed pods are so incredibly fun. <laughs> um, so the Himalayan balsam seed pod, when you touch it, it pops open and uh, it curls back and the seeds are propulsed. And this is to obviously achieve uh, quite a nice spread when the plant is trying to seed. Uh, is trying to plant its seeds and the fascination you know it's a fascinating plant it's incredibly it seems like it would be incredibly fun to engage with unfortunately um, it is technically against the law to purposefully uh, pop Himalayan 
balsam because of its invasive status. So try and steer away from picking that. Standing under the willow in the golden light, it's the damp part of winter now. The strands hang waxy like long, slick hairs, trailing fingers, dragging his hands and exhausted. I know I am holding too tightly. Now, in the rose garden at the end of things, spring. I'm watching it work itself sadly backwards as a blue tit pecks at blossoms and they fall, snowy against blue sky. I send you the seeds saved and the plans for the fluff garden. I walk in the meadows where the ground, saturated with flood water, has lost too much oxygen. The soft seed of the willow is drifting. Thank you.